years back when I returned to Thailand to ordain. John Fung said to me that I was going to have to become skillful at everything in my life as a monk. He said, it's not just a matter of getting good at sitting with your eyes closed. There are lots of other skills you have to master. And it was true. In addition to meditating, I learned how to dye robes, how to sew robes, how to build a place to dye robes. How to become a carpenter, how to mix cement, all kinds of skills I had never known before. And those were just the practical, physical details around the monastery. You look at the Buddha's path, and there's never anywhere where he says just one skill will take care of everything. path has eight factors, or it can be divided into three types of training. Training in virtue, training in concentration, training in discernment. Meritorious activity has three kinds. There's generosity, virtue again, and meditation. And the Buddha was famous for making lists of all the different qualities that were required in the practice. And there's never a list of one. Which means that as you practice, you've got to learn how to balance lots of qualities. And you have to master, master lots of skills. And an important part of the practice is learning how to balance them out. So it's not that you, not only that you can do separate things skillfully, but you figure out, well, what's the appropriate thing to do right now? Which particular skill should get emphasis? And a lot of this has to do with your motivation. This is where the issue of skill gets tied together with the issue of merit. And tie the two are. The two terms are used together very often. Bunya is merit, skill, and gusala, or in Thai, bun gusan. To the point where most people assume that the two are actually part of the same concept. They're actually two separate concepts that have to be developed together. Bunya, or merit, as the Buddha once said, the activities of merit are another word for happiness. In other words, these are the things you do to be truly happy. This ties in with the Buddha's insight that everything we do is for the sake of happiness, every action we take. Of course, some types of happiness require sacrifice. Many times our happiness requires other people's sacrifice, but there are times when our own happiness requires that we sacrifice something as well, even in an extreme case. Or say a mother is willing to risk her life to protect her child. It's because she feels that she would be happier dead than having to live with the thought that she hadn't done everything to protect the child and the child had died. So sometimes we're faced with difficult choices like that. But we end up choosing which one we think is going to make us happier. So everything we do has a purpose. We think of the consequences of our actions, like the, the merit of generosity. We many times like to think that we're doing something with totally selfless motives. But actually what we're doing is we have our own thought of gain, but it's a gain that doesn't harm anyone else. That's the ideal. To be totally selfless, to put your happiness aside some outside power's decision of what you should or shouldn't do is a very unhealthy situation to be in. Or to say that you're totally going to sacrifice yourself for other people. Well, there's a, a lack of honesty there. Someplace deep down inside, there's a sense there's going to be a reward that's going to come from this. 
and sort of instead of denying the reward, we have to be frank about it. We're generous because we want to gain something out of the generosity. There's a sutta where the Buddha ranks the various kinds of generosity or various kinds of motivation for generosity. The lowest one is, I'll get this back with interest. And it goes to progressively higher ones. The, the middle one, interestingly enough, is because it feels good to be generous. You delight in the sense of just your own inner goodness that comes when you're give, able to give something away. That too is a reward. That's the motivation. It's only until you get to the level of once returning that you can give simply out of a sense that this is a natural ornament, as I say, for the mind. It's a natural expression of the mind state at that point. But prior to that point, all generosity is motivated by some thought of getting something in return. Simply the question of how sophisticated and how noble the motivation is. The same goes for the precepts. You can observe the precepts to be a good little boy or a good little girl, and there's a certain satisfaction that comes from that. But as you get into, into the practice of the precepts, you begin to realize that the precepts help you live with yourself more easily. You know that you live in the world without harming anybody, and it becomes a gift to everybody. You're not going to harm them, anybody at all, under any circumstances. And as the Buddha said, you gain, a re you gain a part of that universal protection as well. Meditation is a meritorious activity. And again, we can come to it with different motivations. For some people, it's simply a time to relax. There are people who meditate in order to gain power. There are people who meditate because they want psychic powers. But the highest motivation the Buddha gave was that if you realize that you're suffering, and this is the way out, you need to train the mind. And so on the one hand, there's the sense of ease and well-being that comes when you get the mind to settle down. And then there's the greater happiness that comes as you're able to get, let go of your various defilements, gain the insights that peel away the fetters that tie you, that constant cycle of birth and death and rebirth and redeath, again and again and again. As you cut those fetters, there's a, a lightness that comes into the mind, a sense of extreme relief. That, too, is a form of happiness. So all these things we do are for the sake of happiness. They combine it with the principle of skill. It means, on the one hand, you try to do each of these things in as skillful a way as possible, with generosity, for, in for instance. Years back, there was a group of people who would come regularly, and they'd always bring big donations of toilet paper. And it never occurred to them, look, to the side of the sala, where it was just overflowing with toilet paper. We could have had a toilet paper store here with practically every brand available, until someone finally took the, per the group aside and said, hey, look, could you, you know, could you bring something we really need? And this is where the, the merit of generosity moves into the skill of seeing, well, am I really benefiting the other person with my generosity, or am I just doing it because I like that particular gift? Or I feel that it's impressive. In the years back when I was in charge of a John Fuang's funeral commemoration, we did it once a year. Part of it was we would invite monks from some nearby monasteries to come and chant. So that year I went down with a layperson, and we went to different stores in Ryong, and I got some things that I thought were really cool things. Really nice soap, a really nice little bowl for the a dipper they call a kan in Thai, nice stainless steel one. Some nice soap, some nice liquid detergent, things that monks rarely got. 
and they were a nice little package. And the people came from Bangkok and said, you're going to give that little package to the monks? And I said, well, look at what's in the package. It's nice stuff. And they said, that's not what matters. It has to be big. So they went out and got more toilet paper <laughs> and a big box of Tide. So there are lots of different motivations for why you give. And it's all meritorious. But the question of how skillful it is, that's something else. It requires you look at what's really needed here. What can I afford so I'm not harming myself? And what would really be of help to that other person? That's where the skill comes in. The same with the precepts. You may hold to the precept that you're not going to gossip, i.e. you're not going to engage in idle chatter. And you find yourself gossiping with somebody else, and so then you suddenly stop and say, Oh my gosh, this is gossip. We shouldn't be doing this. Well, the other person is going to feel miserable. It's more skillful to steer the conversation away from the gossip in a seamless way. So that you don't come across as a censorious, censorious kind of person. In other words, all of these practices require that you use your intelligence to look at what would be the best results to come from this. I mean, all these activities are meritorious; they do lead to happiness. But you can also add your intelligence. And that's another translation of the, the way the Thais understand the word gusala, gusong, is that it's intelligent, chalat. You combine your desire for happiness with, with your intelligence. In this way you find the right motivation, you know, the right gift, the right motivation, the right person to receive the gift, the right motivation for your precepts, the right ways to observe the precepts in ways that don't offend other people. And then you can carry both of those qualities into the meditation and the combination of happiness and skill will serve you in good stead. Because as I said, in the meditation there are lots of qualities you've got to balance. So think of this path as a path of many skills. And John Lee's image is of a tree with lots of branches. Banana trees just have one, one shoot that comes up, but they don't last very long. They grow fast, but then they rot out very quickly. Big trees have lots of branches. They take time to grow, but the fact that they have all those branches means that they last a lot longer, give much better shade. So all the skills that we need to develop here in the monastery, everything from learning how to clean the monastery, how to take care of things, as the phrase is in Thai, everything from washing the spittoons on up. It's all part of the practice in getting a sense of well-being and in developing your intelligence. Because intelligence doesn't just come from reading books and thinking about them. It comes from actually doing something and then looking at the results are, and then figuring out how you can do it better. That's the kind of intelligence the Buddha is looking for on the path. And it's an intelligence that ultimately can bring a balance to all the variables. All the different qualities you're trying to develop here. You're trying to develop conviction and persistence and mindfulness and concentration and discernment. And that's just one list. But as you gain a more and more intuitive sense of what's balance and how to combine lots of skills together, that's what's going to keep your practice from going off course.
there's a tendency in Western Buddhism to look down on the practice of merit, but it's, it's an essential part of the path, realizing that you are here for happiness. You do expect results. But it's going to depend on your willingness to put something into the practice. That's part of the lesson you learn from the practice of merit. On the other, as you get more and more familiar with the practice, is that your sense of who you are is going to change by what you do. And you begin to find that old ways of finding happiness really aren't worth holding on to anymore. So you learn to let go of them. This is one of your first lessons in not-self, the things that used to define who you are start falling by the wayside. So even though the practice of merit may seem like a selfish practice, it's not. It's training and looking at your motivation, training and looking at action, and how you think about happiness and how you find your happiness, and asking you to really look seriously at it instead of pretending that you're not in this for anything. You admit freely that you're in it to gain true happiness. And then the next question is, what is the true and true happiness? And as you try to develop both merit and skill in the practice, you find that you get closer and closer to the answer. <laughs>